Okay, I just finished making my... Oh, turn this a little bit. Just finished making my video about Jordan Peterson and Barry Weiss. I want to get back into that, but I want to play some of Rebel Wisdom's recent video with Zach Stein because... So, we're trying to lay people out on the landscape here. And so here we have Jordan Peterson and Barry Weiss, and they're quite close together in terms of where they are. At the end of that video, you sort of had that moment of... Oh, the, you know, the, the wounded lions. I can't say it any better than Jordan. I mean, you see, Jordan's just... Jordan's just the master of this. And, and there we have Barry Weiss, and she's, you know, this is the moment to give our all. And, you know, Jordan, I mean... The earnestness twins, these two are. But if you're thinking that what we can do is take a step back and hold, that's not going to happen. Maybe take a step back and try and go a new direction because I also think that the the woke the woke won't work. The woke won't work. It, it just will not work. It will eat itself. We've got ample we've got ample evidence of that. Just watch Benjamin Benjamin Boyce's channel. Uh, it won't work. You're just going to keep eating yourselves to death. It's not a path that leads to life. Well, what will lead to life? Now, of course, I'm a Christian minister, and so you know, listen to my sermons, and I talk about that there. And so for the someone who's going to say, let more Jesus and less Jordan, well, okay, um, watch my church channel, and you'll get plenty of Jesus. And to say that, I don't, um, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not trying to draw a comparison between them, but I want to pay attention to the present moment and the various communities and where they're going. And so in the strange estuary that I'm in the middle of, we've got the IDW types like Jordan and Brett Weinstein and, and Barry Weiss. We've got the IDW types, but we've also got the Verveke types. And that group, as well as the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics and the Protestants, so we're all we're all here swimming in the estuary together, and it's helpful because you know, sort of in that estuary moment in this conversation between Barry and Jordan. Um, okay, well, we got an estuary. Let's keep talking. Zach is a philosopher of education who coined the term "a time between worlds." The broader sense that. The time between worlds was like catalyzed, that there was a sense that everyone became aware of the, um, the liminality of the position of the human. Um, and now I know that I just triggered some of you. If I really triggered your heart, you're probably not, you know, you're used to it. I, I trigger lots. I'm an equal opportunity trigger in this space. So he, he's actually talking between heaven and earth. So we're, we're, you know, part of the reason Peugeot every now and then can be found on Rebel Wisdom and talks to Verveke is even though in some ways they're sort of on different sides of this and there I'm the Protestant in the middle. In other ways, this is back where we're at. I mean, John Verveke in his Awakening from the Meaning Crisis wants to get away from a two worlds mythology, but... With Zach Stein, we're sort of back in it, and, and we're between these worlds. And the question is, okay, well, what do we know of heaven? And in, in a lot of ways, that is the question. And that's where, of course, Christians come in with a lot more detail because they say, well, I think we actually know some things about that. Instead of always trying to sort of project up from below, because, of course, in in contemporary secularity, there's a real skepticism about what can be seen from below or what can be received from above. But, but you know, right away here, well, it's between worlds. So, you know, when after I'd listened to David Fuller and, and Jonathan Rousen, I listened to this and I thought, yeah, the first part of this video. Now, some of where it goes, not everybody's going to like, but the first part, just pay attention because that's the point of the Barry Weiss, Jordan Peterson. There's no sort of holding our present position or saying, no, one step back and that's far enough. There's no humanity keeps moving. And, and really the only question is where is the telos in heaven that you're actually going to be moving towards? I think that 
uh, continues. He's also a co-founder of the Consilience Project with Daniel Schmachtenberger, which is aimed at improving the information landscape and of sparking a cultural renaissance. Zach's a really interesting guy, and this was a great conversation, so I hope you enjoy it. So, Zach, I want to start with that. Now, this little, this little um, Zoom square thing, so Rebel Wisdom does that, and I think that's a... I, I don't know the nomenclature that they use, a member or... But anyway, you know, that's, that's... So when I listen to Barry Weiss and Jordan talking about... I, I would probably participated in one of these last week with them, with Jonathan Rouse, and, and I don't know, you know what David's going to do with the recording, but anyway, it's fine. But you know, I, I really congratulate David on doing this kind of thing because what Jordan and Barry are talking about in some ways David is doing. Now, you might not agree the heaven that David is sort of pointing to, but he's at least in some ways putting together a congregation. You know, again, back to, well, maybe I'll play it again. Maybe this is going to be one of the videos I just play over and over and over and over again. That's why I put it on my Vanderclips channel. I wanted to start maybe with Tara's point about sort of the you know, the durability of this kind of, um, I'll conflate your two points and say the durability of imminent mm. individualist religion in American life, right? And the fact that you have plenty of, you know. Now, the UK is very much a part of this because in some ways America, you know, they went in different traditions, but seldom do, <laughs> seldom do Americans go on a trippy um tour of religion and at least the the brits didn't start it or follow along divination and god within spirituality going back to the 18th century um it, it seems to me that if you look at sort of the historical pattern in american life you have sort of either surges of that kind of spirituality or particular religious geniuses who manifest it and then the movements and institutions that they build have historically then been sort of pulled back towards a kind of normative Christian structure or framework to to use to use Steve's account, right? So you know to take to take the examples of the the two biggest nineteenth century examples maybe are Christian Science, which comes out of New Thought in certain ways, and Mormonism, which gets its start in the sort of in you know the kind of divination happy yeah. world of upstate New York in the, in the in the in the early 19th century. That that's imp you know I know for some people trigger wisdom tr trigger wisdom <laughs> rebel wisdom might trigger you a little bit, but you might look at Mormonism and say oh what a conservative religion and they are. They sort of preserved you know when I talked about Jordan and Barry sort of trying to preserve something. Mormonism tries to preserve something. I remember when I first visited their, you know, their complex in Salt Lake City and toured their museum, I thought, this is the most American religion I can imagine. They really are. So so what happens when you preserve something like that? You sort of you sort of seal it in time and try to hold on to it as is. But that's only one part of Mormonism. The other part of Mormonism is that it is a prophetic religion. So they always have these prophets coming and, you know, revising the prophecies. And and so in that way, they're they're quite a bit like rebel wisdom, even though rebel wisdom is 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 much more inhabiting the um fog, the bright fog of secularism. Rebel wisdom is doing the same thing. And so the visions and the dreams and the integral and spiral dynamics and the the you know the men's work the um the psychedelics the meditation the eastern ideas that's all part of it and you might look at mormonism and say well that's that's the opposite of mormonism but no not really not really and both of those you know if you if you look at them from a sort of you know how christian are they perspective at at, at the outset, you can make a case that they're both pretty stark departures, maybe not getting all the way to something we call paganism or post-Christianity, but clearly really stark departures. Um, you know, 
in, in Mormonism's case, you know, you mentioned polyamory, right, as a feature mm -hmm. of the contemporary political landscape. Early Mormonism goes all the way to polygamy. And then, over the course of the next hundred years, you get to a point where by the time of the 1950s and 1960s, both Christian Science and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, while they're still regarded as heretical or dangerous or cultic by some other Christian denominations, are, I think, reasonably seen as connected to a kind of, you know, a, a kind of Christian tradition. In okay. Now... I think the reason for this dynamic is that is the only way these new traditions can actually last. My example of this is the Oneida community, and I've mentioned this book over time. It's a great book. If you want a fascinating read about the dynamics of religion, especially when it comes to sexuality, the 19th century, and, and how they morph and shape in the 20th century, I mean, here's a community that practiced free love, uh, practiced, um, you know, they practiced eugenics, read a little bit from the introduction. John Humphrey Noyes and his followers, Edmund wrote, had been Christian perfectionists, religious dissidents and reformers in the best American tradition intent on, on forming a community resembling the early churches described in the Acts of the Apostles and calling themselves Bible communists. Noise and his followers pooled all their possessions and lived and worked together as an extended family, striving, striving to become one body in Christ through total selflessness. But if they sought to restore the communal harmony of the age of the apostles, Noise and his band of Bible communists were no starry-eyed romantics. As the twin dynamos of the market revolution and the industrial revolution were transfiguring the American landscape in the 1840s, John Humphrey Noyes and his followers energetically embraced capitalism and the technological wizardry of the modern age era, from the steam engine to the telegraph, as the wings that would bring to fruition the new Jerusalem pried loose from their selfish interests of the property-owning few and transformed into the servant of communism and the spirit of heaven, modern capitalism would usher in a reign of peace and plenty unknown since Adam's expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Again, it's utopian. Now, of course, this is before the communism of Engel, you know, and, and the Soviet Union. Edmonds went on to explain in the first hundred years that while the Oneida community had dissolved as a social and religious entity in 1880, the bold experiment in human relations initiated by Noyes Sr. had carried forth in the economic sphere by Noyes' son Pierpont and his fellow community descendants who took the old pictures of sharing and equality inherited from his father and applied them to the industrial production of the silverware. Oneida Limited prided itself on the equity and dignity that it, that, it, that it accorded all of its members, from the lowest factory hand to the president of the company itself. It was in an institution that, true to the founder's principles, held that every man and woman whose work contributed contributes to the success of the company is entitled to an equitable share in the company's profits." prizing the common good over private and individual interests. Edmund's commemorative history closes with a section of glossy back and black and white photos from the company and its homey small town environments from the village block hardware store, merchandise is displayed on the sidewalks in a neighborly way, to the stately trees surrounding the old communal homestead, proud of their ancient lineage and living reminders of the thought and vision of those who painted them, who planted them generations ago. And well, it was a wild place. Um, and again, I, I highly recommend the book. It's uh, it is on it is on Audible. It's a terrific read if you want to get a sense of um, if you want to get a sense of well, how variable we can be. But again, to get to the point that Douthat is about to make, that I will play. Look at the form and shape that they followed as a community. Notice the difference today in terms of platforms. Well, I'm on Substack. I'm not complaining about YouTube or Substack or Twitter. I'm in all those places. And I do so as a Christian minister. And I minister in a local congregation. But the platform question has been disrupted. And 
now when Barry Weiss and Jordan Peterson ask themselves how we can take a step back and reclaim whether it's Jordan Peterson, what, I mean, at what age does Jordan Peterson want to go back to? Does he want to go back to maybe 2000 before 9-11? Does Barry Weiss, she's not going to want to go back any, you know, any less than 2013 in order to save her marriage. So where are we going with this and what are the platforms that we're using? In American life, and there's clearly an aspiration at least among parts of the leadership of those, of those, what become those churches to move in that direction. And what that hasn't, it seems to me, one thing that's been different since the 60s and 70s, right, is that that hasn't happened to the same degree, right? So we've gone through the sort of Marianne Williamson presidential campaign, which um, unfortunately has not won enough support to merit the fascination that I've applied to it. Um, but, I feel like a 19th century version of Marianne Williamson would have started a church, right? And would have, you know, and, and over the course of 50 years, there would be a sort of Williamsonian denomination that had some sort of ambiguous relationship to um, the Protestant center in American life. And, uh, you know, Williamson has some kind of institution now, but it's very clear that she doesn't regard herself as sure. in that light. And the same goes for, you know, figures ranging from Deepak Chopra to Oprah Winfrey and so on. And so I'm curious what you think. His question was better than her answer, so I'll leave it there. So again, back to rebel wisdom. To what degree does has David Fuller established a congregation? And you know, in a session like this, well, even just the even just the the Zoom squares are nearly sacramental because they talk of well, we're all joining the conversation. So deeply egalitarian. Yeah, you know, we're, we're also going to have, you know, a little sermon at the outset, and then you can ask questions. And, you know, so I mean, what, are, what we're doing, and, and I, I'm not critiquing David. I, when, when I was there last week, I said, good for you. Keep doing this. This is important. And I'm doing the same thing in my own way with my Friday question and answer on Discord. I've got to get the local meetup going again here in Sacramento. After that, probably another meetup tour to probably help meetups start in different places. So, you know, I'm swimming in this estuary here. That's what we're doing. But I think Zach Stein is right. We're, you know, we're, we're looking at heaven and earth and, and what we're doing in a lot of ways is saying, well, what we really have to do is sort of talk about heaven. Well, why? What, what, what do you mean by that? Because in this dynamic, heaven is, is where we're going. It's the good. It's the ideal. It's, it's, it's where all things should finally attain to. And of course, in Christianity, you have the marriage of heaven and earth in the book of Revelation. So the concept of a time between worlds, because implicit in that is the idea that we're moving from one world. And I think a lot of people have talked about that, the kind of sense of civilizational collapse or certainly the end of a, of, a, of a way of being that many of the people in Rebel Wisdom have spoken to, but also there's a suggestion there that there is a destination. Do you have a sense of what that destination is? And so when Barry Weiss sort of pauses, maybe I'll, it's a different video, so maybe I should play it. I've still got them all sort of queued up here. Also on Substack, and I think it's extremely interesting. The thing that I think is a challenge. It's like an IDW of journalists. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I think is is challenging, right, is if you're like a dentist or an accountant or a lawyer, and I meet a lot of these people and they say, I don't trust the New York Times anymore, what do I read? I need a new clergy. Well, it's a really dissatisfying answer because I'm like, well, you need to subscribe to these 10 sub stacks and listen to these five podcasts and follow right, these right. 30 people on Twitter. No, like that's not gonna work. So, so in some ways, you know, David Fuller has lots of voices under his channel. So he's he's in a sense doing a similar thing to Barry, but I think he's a little further down the road. But he's also coming out of journalism, remember. He, he's you know, one commenter. I, I, I don't mean any disrespect to anyone who's been on uh, David's channel, but the one commenter said, David Wilson says, you know, the reason I don't like Rebel Wisdom is because David Wilson says things better than anybody who bring, brings on his channel, which is both kind of, you know, flattering and 
So mm -hmm. I am extremely interested in, in what I've been referring to, like how do I make a common address for that sensibility, that independent minded. Okay, so it's a sensibility. Spirit um, that, you know, is not like centrist in the sense of like just finding the middle path, but is able to see truth on, on but is able to separate, let's say, identity from ideas and is able to say, yeah, that person maybe sucks on this thing, but they're really right about that. Like, so that's heaven she's trying to describe. She's trying to get there where the others are, are trying to go. Hmm. Uh, in specific, no. In specific, no. And there is a suggestion there that there is a destination. Do you have a sense of what that destination is? Hmm. Uh, in specific, no. In specific, no. And I, I'm not going to critique him for that answer because I can use religious terminology, but that's punting. You want me to get specific? And I, again, I'll, I'll give you religious terminology. And a bunch of you will hear it as religious terminology and it'll, it'll put you off. And then I'll tell stories, and then I'll give images, and then I'll give illustrations, and that will help you a little bit more. And but within this congregation he's got here, there's already a fair amount of commonality which has gathered them because you sort of get gathered. You can't put the words on it, but you sort of know it when you see it, and so it draws you. And or maybe it's not this, but that. And there is in when you're in the position of being you know, between worlds, uh, which you say is... And that's both... I gotta get my... I'm dyslexic, so I can never get the... If I put it in front of my face, it'll be on the camera. There's between worlds this way, but there's also sort of between worlds this way. And so Jordan um, Jordan and Barry are, you know, okay, we're gonna stop. We're gonna stop history at this point. I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't want to say that that's what they're saying, because I don't know that if that would be fair, because I think both of them would say, no, that's not what I'm saying. But I would have to say, OK, but you're going to have to tell me where this is. You can't just say, well, we reached the peak before the wokeness started. That's not good enough. Poetic, but it's actually basically a sociological construct <laughs> that I took from Emmanuel Wallerstein. It's a very specific techno-economic position. We're between the basic structures of institutions <clears throat> and uh so in a sense that we're in that uh, kind of hard fork or catastrophic bifurcation of a complex dynamical system situation where this wouldn't cut it unless you're talking to a whole bunch of people who are quite well read are pretty wonky on this terminology but in all fairness to them this is another sort of religious language because if I were to translate it into Christianese, a whole bunch of other people would understand what I'm saying because Christianese is still fairly broadly spoken in America, but less so with every increasing year. Yet the ideas beneath the Christianese are still out there in terms of our movies and just about everything else. There's a destination. <laughs> it's either higher order coherence or lower order recoherence, which in this case probably isn't possible given the existence of nuclear reactors and and uh, other. Again, you know, I, so some of you are going to listen to this and say, I don't know what this dude is talking about. Just just bear with me. He's got a couple of things that you are going to understand. Things. So, so, yeah, we're looking for a way through the eye of the needle towards some kind of... Uh, there's some words from Jesus. ...kind of more complex, more coherent way of getting humans to cooperate at scale, and my concern being getting humans to educate <clears throat> at scale. Get so his background is education. Getting humans to actually transform capacity, their own internal capacity, not technological capacity, which is important. We need to figure out. So in Verveke terms, that's agency. How to do all of that stuff. <laughs> but in order to do that, the prerequisite is actually getting our skills in order, getting our mindsets and emotional dispositions and those kinds of things in order. Um, now, none of this would cut mustard either in a Christian community or in sort of the socio-political community 
the the let's say the wavelength that Peterson and Barry Weiss are operating on. And again, part of David Fuller's critique of Peterson is that he and Weiss keep sort of he doesn't talk about Weiss, but Peterson keeps sort of defaulting back to the political register. And now Peterson's got a very broad spectrum. So Peterson does do the political thing, but he also does the religious thing, which is what, say, Sam Harris would complain complain about. And so there's, there's a lot going on here. So, yeah, one of the aspects of the destination is something like a, uh, a new personhood a new kind of personhood, a new basic set of... What on earth does he mean by that? I'm already a person. Oh, okay. Um, but remember when Weiss was talking about identity? Hmm. Now we're starting to get a little closer. Of citizen capacities, if you will. And... David, oh, I'm going to have to bring this down to earth a little bit more. Your focus is primarily on education. Do you say that it's primarily an educational crisis, or is, do you feel that that's just your particular piece to hold? Okay, that was plain English. We could understand that. Uh, if you define education the way I define it, which is much more broadly than just schools, uh, then I think you could you could make the argument that, in a sense, the the crisis that contains all of the other smaller crises. <laughs> this is one way of thinking about the meta crisis. That crisis that contains all of the other crises is something like a crisis of the human mind. It's a crisis of our ability to grapple and hold the situation. And then still pretty, come on down, come on down. Got to, got to use language. A lot of other folks can understand, but we're going to get there. Hold on. And to change our capacities and orientation. <clears throat> To the situation. Um, so when you think about uh, deep adaptation, um, it is both technological and psychological. And I believe psychology is maybe the primary mover here. So in that sense, broadly construed, <laughs> it is fundamentally an educational crisis. So you mean, yes. Uh, there are crises in the schools, but I define education as the that whole process of intergenerational transmission, which can be fundamentally disrupted and and has been a catastrophic bifurcation of intergenerational transmission is a civilizational collapse vector and basically to translate he'd say that's kind of what's going on right now we're having some of that not all of it not as bad as it could be but there's something has disrupted long the long-standing capacity within human communities to pass down knowing how to live at a very basic level. Let's say it that way. If you will, um, it's one of the things that happens when civilization collapses, no matter what, but it's also can happen as one of the things that kind of causes it <laughs> to more rapidly occur. The uh, abrupt and profound loss of skill uh, and capacity and emotional disposition and those things. Mm. And <laughs> David, Ford, okay, let's see, pull him back down again. And you, I've heard you describe it as a loss of teacherly authority. Does that is that the core? Ah, David knows words that people know. Loss of teacherly authority. Hmm. Or a bit, would you say? Uh, teacherly authority. Does that is that the core of it? Would you say? Uh. It, it's one way to think about the core of it. It's one of the things that is essential to amend as part of any resolution. Um, the the kind of uh, the uh, the diagnostic, if you will, does, it, it expands beyond just the collapse of teacherly authority. That is something that characterizes our situation. But we're looking at a a multi institutional educational crisis, essentially. Um, and this is where we get back to the. Why the Jordan Peterson Barry Weiss conversation because it's multi institutional. You'll hear Jordan Peterson. The real crisis, well, the, let's see, how can I say it? Jordan Peterson saw this crisis in his own shop. Let's say it that way. 
and and at the heart of Peterson's cry, his religious cry that that you see in the Barry Weiss Jordan Peterson conversation is the loss of the academy to facilitate at least its share of teacherly authority and what Zach Stein Zach Stein was saying with all of those fancy words and uh so yeah the collapse of teacherly authority which is to say the absence of those contexts in which um you can exercise that holistic intergenerational transmission right um that is a key node so it's good that you identified that yeah uh, mm -hmm. so in in some sense that is the core of it and how did we get here how did we get here? That's the broader question, right? Yeah, if the problem, I mean, the collapse of teacherly authority, I think is a, when I first heard you say that, it made a lot of sense and it was a really helpful frame. Um, but I just wonder if we could unpack that a little bit. Uh, and how have we got there? Is it is it mostly the impact of technology? Is it a, a bigger shift between kind of like the, 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 the generation gap has now become a chasm in some ways. I mean, what are the what are the factors that have led to this place where we're at now, where we sort of feel very adrift? Yeah, it's it's definitely multi <laughs> multifactorial. You know, um, if you like Marshall McLuhan, then you look at something like the basic paradigmatic shifts in communications technologies from print to electric to digital. <clears throat> at each one of those. You had major educational and again print to mass electric to individual personal digital crises major educational crisis now in each one of those up to the digital which is the one we're in uh you had um educational crises in context where you didn't have existential technology which is to say technology that can destroy the whole planet and all the humans on it. <laughs> so it's okay if everyone got confused for 30 or 40 years, like happened at the end of the long 16th century with 30 years war after the printing press finally took hold and the Catholic church invented propaganda and you had this total warfare, including informational warfare. I'd say the Protestants were pretty good at propaganda too. <laughs> which was an educational crisis. And you could argue, as maybe Alexander Bard might, that that whole route from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment was about dealing with the implications of the printing press. So you could argue, similarly, we're in a situation where the digital has disrupted intergenerational transmission, and we're in that. So that's one route. I think that's certainly true, and I agree. But there are other ones. <clears throat> you know, um, the economic... Uh, the way economic systems uh, began to superordinately kind of like design educational systems, which I call reductive human capital theory, <laughs> where the educational system becomes a servant to the economy, where the whole point of the school is to fix the economic system. <clears throat> this is another thing, the importing. Now, if you know any of the constant intramural warfare within education you can locate some of this what he's talking about here because this, this these have been like these little wars in education and so my wife's an educator so i you know overhear some of these little warfares and little schools but again that that's schools then there's there's in america you've got public schools which are the the default school systems but they're you know, there's school boards and localities, and even in a place like Sacramento, there's the SAC Unified School District, and there's other school districts around. And so you know, you've got some of that, but then you've got private education. And so the it, it's not unlike the church landscape. And then the same with, with, um, with uh, university education. It used to be colleges. Again, I went to Calvin College. Um, now it's Calvin University. Everything's got to be a university because colleges are kind of a little, these little sub things. And internationals, when they hear you have a degree from college, Calvin College, that's the colegio, that's the high school. No, 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 it's 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 a college. Yeah, anyway, so so there's all this stuff going on. Of market models, financializations of education, 1972 creation of the student loan, the corporation in the United States. Uh, these things were part of it, right? Um, I think you also have uh, 
a factor which again has been playing out since the end of the long 16th century the beginning of this <clears throat> this world that we're leaving um uh the family right the family as a target of colonization and commodification <laughs> uh that the family has been disrupted um first by labor systems now i know some of you out there when i started playing this rebel wisdom video your eyes rolled back and you thought oh boy here we go but then you heard him say this and sounds like oh oh uh, and then by communications technologies <clears throat> and now by biomedical technologies the the medicalization of the family structure uh and the medicalization of academic underperformance. So there's been kind of some major dynamics in the kind of like basic unit of the family. So what do you mean by the medicalization of the family structure there? Um, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's one of the ways you can think about the family and the things that used to be handled in the context of family uh, as being transferred into uh kind of bureaucratic management which also ends up being like a profit extraction center so like when you're dealing with an ill or sick relative or dying relative uh, i remember obama speaking to this once that you're dealing with insurance paperwork like you're having these conversations in the hospital of course but you're also dealing with insurance paperwork dealing with financial strain dealing with complex systems of authority uh, and medical decision making which outstrip your capacity to actually resist them um, <clears throat> and so it used to be your, the religious authority showed up and you hung around the bedside and you did what you could and <laughs> the person was sick and died uh, and that was held in what Harvards would call the life world oh, see, some of you are thinking oh 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 um, so as the family system uh, first gets brought into like, okay, now you're regulating your whole day based on the wage labor system. <laughs> and then it gets brought into you're regulating it on the TV <laughs> and uh, the rhythms of what is broadcast and when. Uh, and now it's being even uh, more higher order regulated <laughs> in terms of a whole bunch of dynamics, including the spine medical one. So. And suddenly all the conservatives are like, hey, wait a minute. We've been talking about that for a while. Um, and again, this is part of what um, our basic institutions are kind of in a sense, sense built to do. They're, they're in a sense benignly carrying out their um, defective generator functions, if you will, as Schmack Berger would, would put it. So it's not some conspiracy to take over the family. It's about um, building medical systems and insurance systems in a certain way, uh, building broadcast technologies in a certain way eventually building digital technologies like your phone in a certain way. So we've been paying a lot of attention to platforms. Marianne Williamson, if she had lived in the 19th century, would have started a church. Billy Graham didn't start a church. There's no Grahamism around, although we maybe could use that term. Billy Graham and the neo-evangelicals in the middle of the 20th century in North America modulated what was the the fundamentalist movement and took off some of the the sharper edges of it and popularized it and you know again Jordan Peterson in the first wave was a pretty potent um, was a pretty potent movement but nothing like Billy Graham Billy Graham's was far more long lasting Billy Graham's you know, Jordan Peterson could fill the Sacramento theater you know 2500 3000 people you know, maybe even one in Dublin to 10,000 people for a major talk with with um, Douglas Murray and Sam Harris. But Billy Graham filled Yankee Stadium. Billy Graham changed them and had a whole network of churches between him and called them down. And But he didn't really start a church, but he didn't turn his way from the church. Christianity Today was sort of the masthead, Fuller Seminary. So you can see more, uh, you know, left the 19th century into the 20th century, and you can see the platforms changing. But now these platforms that Zach Stein are talking about, you know, I have members of my church that could remember when they were children, when their grandpa died, you 
laid him out in the house. Now, and then the, the next iteration after that was the funeral home. Well, why, what, 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 is, what is so homish about a funeral? Well, you call it a funeral home because you used to lay out grandpa in the house. And this one member of the church, he's no longer alive himself now. But he said, you know, he his grandpa was laying downstairs and he was a little boy and he didn't want to go downstairs because there's there's dead grandpa laying in the hallway, in the front hall where people would come in and, you know, have calling hours. Well, what on earth is calling hours in funeral homes? Funeral homes, calling hours. These are all vestiges of what was still happening in the early part of the 20th century. And... You know, now Zach Sign is, is pointing to all of these changes, all of these changes that have happened. And, well, there's, there's another thing that I want to get to. I don't remember in detail everything he's about to say now. Maybe I'll play a little bit more of it. <clears throat> Where the screen now runs interference between family conversation in a pretty systematic way. Um, and then what you're reading on the screen uh, is imported uh, into family conversation to disrupt <laughs> uh, what used to be community um, and uh, care. So, so that's a little that's a little bit. Of, so it's multi institutional, generational crisis. Um, then you get things like post postmodern critical theory, uh, the kind of turn towards complexity science, uh, and a whole bunch of other factors that also made teacherly authority in particular very 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 vexed and that's ah now you're seeing the connections aren't you part of the breakdown of the schools contributed to that because many teachers have teacherly authority by virtue of having bureaucratic authority <laughs> whereas legitimate teacherly authority is held by virtue of having actual epistemic asymmetry <laughs> epistemic asymmetry what a epistemic asymmetry they know more than you but not just bureaucratic they now we get back to jordan peterson they live it out they practice it they know how to act in the world how to act in the world in order to what in order to move up Jacob's ladder and get closer to heaven to move up. They know how to have success in life to do better. <laughs> that makes sense. <clears throat> and so to the degree that the schools cease to work, people become critical of the idea of teacherly authority because they mostly encounter it in a bureaucratized context. Uh, and then you get the media like the New York Times or Fox or whatever, which is also supposed to be holding some teacherly authority, they obviously become problematic. <laughs> so, you're, so everyone's looking around where, who is the person I can trust with the future of my mind? Where can I look for guidance, especially from elders, <clears throat> about the ways of the world? Both what is legitimate in terms of authority, both what makes sense in terms of the world, uh, and what's meaning making. And the meaning crisis is also in part of the cascade of the underlying educational crisis. Uh, so yeah, so the absence of teacherly authority thrown into the mix of that technological disruption of um, family and et cetera, puts us in a pretty dicey spot, um, uh, which is not a spot of total like incapacitation, but a, a spot of very diverse and stratified capacity and educational opportunity. So we're having people who are smarter than people have ever been. <laughs> like, now you're going to have to ask, what do you mean by smart? Now, again, what you mean by smart, actually, that this gets into, you know, what I want to get into in the Jordan Peterson, Barry Weiss conversation, which is underneath that conversation is both Jordan and Barry have a, an assumption of a world. They have an assumption of the location of heaven with a degree of specificity and saying we reliably could do it on the side. We reliably could make our way to heaven via the New York Times. It had authority. And what both of them lament with the loss of the lions and the tigers is that those authorities are gone. And what do we do? teacherly authority is disrupted and we no longer have it like crazy ridiculously exposed to unprecedented material um kids even talking with nasa scientists in the spaceship and stuff like i didn't do that when i was a kid uh, but 
is very quick. Kids talk to scientists, and I didn't do that when I was a kid. Well, but does that mean anything? So, so again, if you you know, of course, for Jordan Peterson, the the crisis of the academy was critical, and well, maybe I should jump into the jump into the other conversation. Maybe a little more of this. Uh, saturated with disinformation with no access to anything like a healthy epistemic commons or okay now saturated with disinformation so i am a person who sits in the middle of so much of this stuff and so thanks to you because you know you've uh you've made me quite a bit more aware of conservatism than i had been before so thank you and some of you will feel quite proud and happy about that. So there you go. Have I been red-pilled? You can decide. But I listen to both sides. Oh, they, they, don't, they don't know what they're talking about because they only read, and then it's the New York Times or it's Fox News. They don't know what they're talking about. But we know what we're talking about because we read the New York Times or Fox News. The epistemic commons. The epistemic commons gets at, well, the truth, objective objectivity, subjectivity is personal. Objectivity is what we all need. To, the monarchical vision. Again, if you've watched my videos, you know we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. What is the truth? Well, it isn't just that you know. Lots of people who read Fox, you who watch Fox News, and lots of people who read the New York Times, they actually have a lot in common in terms of. A lot of things but which truth the relevant truth how 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 can we know good faith argumentation even when they're in the bureaucracies like schools that are supposed to attend to them uh, in that manner yeah. i'd love to in a second come to sort of solutions i know you're involved with the consilience project so that's one that's one project that's operating in this space but before before that you wrote this uh essay I think I just checked it out. Is at the end of March last year, so in the kind of early throes of COVID, called a war broke out in heaven. And wow, that's a good title. It was at the time where everything, like, it, it was a really intense time, and I reread parts of it just before. And you you mention in it, um, kind of referring to the horsemen of the apocalypse, the great unpatterning, this sense that. I think a lot of us had back then of this real intensity and maybe a lot of us who've been talking about systems change or some kind of shift, um, shift for kind of into new kinds of beings, as you've talked about, had this sense that this was it. This was the crisis that was going to accelerate that kind of shift. And I'm really interested now to look back at that and say, did we overplay it? Do the Millerites are on top of the hill. Jesus is coming right now. He didn't. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus is coming. They had all sorts of dates. You can look them up. Noise. Seventh-day Adventists. Adventists. I, the language has changed. But this basic pattern, 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 pattern. That's a Peugeot meme. This basic pattern continues to play. Do you think that, do you look back at that essay and does it still stand up or do you think that we maybe got caught up in some of this kind of intensity of the moment back then? Hmm. We're all liable. That's an interesting question. I actually haven't looked at that essay uh, in a while. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Does Hal Lindsey really go back and think about 1980 countdown to Armageddon? It's interesting that there's a sense that the crisis is over, or at least that there's a sense that we want the crisis to be over, um, and that there's a turning uh, in the larger narratives towards articulating a sense that the crisis is over. Um, I think my argument was that we're at the be where it's the end of the beginning. <laughs> uh, and that we're in a cascading set of compounding crises. Um, so <clears throat> the 
broader sense that the time between worlds was like catalyzed, that there was a sense that everyone became aware of the, um, the liminality of the position of the human. Um, and, and in that, in some ways, Barry Weiss is, well, she's aware now and she's like, let's go back 2013. That was the peak. And I think that, uh, continues. So I'll, I'll be curious to see, like, I, I think the question is in a sense premature, <laughs> like, uh, you know, I suggested that because of what occurred, uh, there was an opening in the imaginal, uh, which occurs when you're between worlds, when, when you're solidly in a world, basically your imagination kind of works like your, your models you throw out are predictive and, <laughs> you know, the, the things you say to others are understood and that like the world is working when the, when you're between worlds, uh, then actually you're forced to expand the imagination. So when this thing first hit in March, there was a sense of um, what would happen. It wasn't clear what the paths that would emerge were. And so there was a time of totally wide open imagination, both towards the good and the bad, like the terrible <laughs> and the amazing. So that whole thing opened up. It's very apocalyptic. Up for a lot of people at the same time. And that's, so that's the notion of the time between worlds. And the notion of the war in heaven is what takes place in people's imaginations. Everyone's not just us all at all strata of society. All the highest power players are also like, whoa, opportunity. <laughs> uh, now remember, Barry Weiss wants to find, we need to, we've got all these little sub stacks down. We need to, we need to coalesce. Well, that's, that happens in heaven. You know, you point up, you pay attention to it. I can't help myself. Got to jump into this video. But then, like when I listen to you or JP Marceau or someone else, you talk about this idea of emanation, right? So I want to I want to look at an example, right? Because well, see, I do this and I didn't tell you what I'm going to do. It drives my wife crazy when I do this stuff. So here's heaven. Well, it, it's all about pointing to heaven. How can how what what is? I mean, that's where that's where. That's where David Fuller started. Is that, well, maybe you can tell us what heaven is. One of the things that that so the, the problem is going to be easier to see emanation at a human scale because it's it has to do with intelligence. Now, again, if you go back to the Peugeot Verveke conversations, th these two are always talking about emergence, which is bottom up, and emanation, which is top down. And again, in, in the secular society, we have for a variety of reasons, deep skepticism about emanation. We have a degree of confidence in emergence, and I think there are psychological uh, reasons for that, but I won't go there right now. It's going to okay. be harder to see it at a biological, like, low level. It's there, but it's harder to see. It's easier to see at a human level. Like, so if you deal with human phenomena... Uh, okay, so let's say I... I uh, I found a, a, a city. I talked about this on my channel recently. It's like, I'm Constantine mm -hmm. and I'm the king, I'm the emperor. And then I found a city. And so I come and I do a sacred ritual. I will take a lance and I will like walk behind an angel to like mark the limit of the city. And, and, and so, so I actually give it a name. I found it, I give it a name. And then it, from that will a city will will appear like people will start to congregate around that center and will start to 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 do the things people in cities do around that sacred gesture that i did like so in the in the uh, let's say there there's there is right nearby where i live there's a town that now, now this is all around authority Constantine has authority, which is recognized. And so when he plants the lance, marking the boundary of the city, you can watch Peugeot. He has a video recently about Constantine and, and Constantinople. That the first thing in the town that was built was a church. And so they built a church, which is a common place, a place of unity where everybody congregates and worships the same thing. And then, you know, a few decades later, there was an entire town built around the church. So that's a form, you could say, like, that's a form of understanding causality from above, which is you found, you name, you, uh, 
you, you know, you create a, a, a coherence and then the world kind of comes in and manifests, uh, manifests from, from, you know, so founding a company, founding uh, anything that is almost human needs to have an aspect of eminence that you can easily perceive for it to, for it to exist. Like for a group to exist, it has to have a name. You have to name it. Right. And so it's like you have a band, you get a bunch of guys together, but it's like, okay, so if we're going to exist, we need a name. And so then you name the band and the name of the band, like if you name the band, uh, the na a name that sounds like a, like a pop band, or if you name the band, the, the, a name that sounds like a, like a death metal band, because those actually can be recognized in the name, yeah. it will affect. So you couldn't have like a death metal name and then make pop songs because it'll be so incoherent that it's going to break apart. So you need to have, so in the name and in the image and in this kind of founding, you need a, you need a type of coherence. Um, so that's a form of, that's a form of, a form of eminence. I mean, there, there are so many, but they're a lot easier to see in, for sure in human, in the human sphere. But I mean, can't you, I mean, can't you see that, that, that emanation itself is derived from an emergence? It's a, it's a, it's both happening at the same time. But you can't only see it as 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 emergent, like you can't. It doesn't like at least to me like the founding of uh, the especially the idea of like the the idea of the founding of something, because it, there's a whole idea that we remember the founding. It's like why do we remember the founding if it's just emergence? Like we 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 retell ourselves the story of the founding of the United States. We tell ourselves the story of these these sacred uh, moments that are the origin of a, of, a, of a community because it actually binds the community together. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to this video. What you're seeing is emanation. What you're not yet seeing is, um, what you're seeing is emergence. What you're not yet seeing is emanation. If you're like a dentist or an accountant or a lawyer, and I meet a lot of these people and they say, I don't trust the New York Times anymore, what do I read? The law, so what is the New York Times lost? It's lost authority. Well, it's a really dissatisfying answer because I'm like, well, you need to subscribe to these 10 sub stacks and listen to these five podcasts and follow right, these right. 30 people on Twitter. No, like that's not going to work. So mm -hmm. I am extremely interested in, in what I've been referring to. Like, how do I make a common address for that sensibility? She's waiting to become a prophet that independent minded spirit um, that, you know, is not like centrist in the sense of like just finding the middle path, but is able to see truth on, on, but is able to see. see? That's all emergence. It's all, it's, it's not that there. She's waiting for emanation. Separate, let's say identity from ideas and is able to say, yeah, that person maybe sucks on this thing, but they're really right about that. Like that's what I'm in. That Vander Clay, he's a Calvinist, but he's really right about whatever you think I'm right about. Interested in building. And so the way that started off for me, and I'm proud of it, is, you know, commissioning op-eds and columns and reported pieces from voices that, you know, sh don't have the platform that I think that they should. But where did she do that from? She did that from a platform. She did that from the New York Times. Um, mm -hmm. and trying to elevate them to my readers, but it's going to be, you know, my podcast, podcast network, and ultimately I... A podcast network. Going to compete with Apple and Spotify and Google? See, now suddenly the platforms matter. If you follow Brett Weinstein on Twitter, I mean, he's been, you know, he's been making a lot of noise because um, YouTube took down, I don't remember the name of the drug, begins with an I, if I say it, maybe YouTube will take down this video too, but he's making make a lot of noise about a drug that was, I listened to that video that he was, um, that's a drug that's all over the place. It's, you know, cheap to make, it's all over the world. And at least some claim is very effective in terms of COVID and YouTube took down his video. And so they'll take to Twitter. They are the platforms. So now sort of back to Zach Stein and say, hey, wait a minute, all of these platforms have sort of snuck up on us and we're between worlds. We're between worlds this way 
because we, we need to we need that emanation we need the name we've got plenty of emergence but emergence without emanation is just sort of flopping around on the dock it doesn't have direction it doesn't it's not incorporated yeah and it was also i mean this this connects it back to your initial question which is what the hell happened at the new york times in a way that answer to that begins in college because that was the first time that I started to encounter what has been called critical social justice or critical race theory or wokeness or what Rod Dreyer's called soft totalitarianism or, or really cultural and moral. Notice how we're still sort of flopping about for names, wokeness, soft totalitarian. Um, I mean, I, I, I called it progressive liberationism when I first started dealing with this in my church life and began listening to certain, I mean, because again, I had been a reliable, I mean, the left of the Christian Reformed Church is not very left in terms of the national spectrum, but I had very much been a part of the left of the Christian Reformed Church, and I began listening very carefully to others and say, hey, wait a minute, things are changing and I don't have names for it. And what am I watching? And there's a lot of, lot of emergence bubbling up. Relativism, to put it more simply. Um, now, relativism, if you'd use that word, you sort of went back to culture warrior. Um, you went back to 1980s culture war fights. I remember very, very clearly getting into an argument with another friend, also identified as a feminist, and she was justifying female genital mutilation to me because that's other people's culture and we need to respect it. Okay. Now, you can, that, that example is a really nice one because you can see things sort of come all the way full circle with respect to this. And this is part of the reason that I never really said, eh, it's not really cultural relativism because we, we sort of see that and, and can understand that. But I want to talk about data and narrative and icons okay data is combinatorial explosion the world is too big we can't manage it all how do we manage it all we manage it we organize it via narrative okay we organize it via narrative and those narratives then it's how it selects what we can take in because it fits the narrative and the things that don't really fit we sort of put over to the side and they'll sit there for a while. And if not, if the pile doesn't get too big, it sort of decays and goes away. But if this is Kuhn and his paradigm shifts, if the pile does get too big, then suddenly we look at our narrative and say, oh, well, the narrative might need to change a little bit because the pile's getting too big. And so then we can incorporate more things and our narrative adjusts, or maybe we take somebody else's narrative. And, and that's sort of how narrative and data work together. You know, not only does not only do we get a first draft from our parents first draft narratives and we use those to see the world again all the jordan peterson sam harris conversations were all about this a priori structure that we knew we need in order to filter to bring in the world so that it's accessible to us so we have a first draft from our parents i'm just i'm just you know i'm i'm compressing a whole bunch of videos right now for you but then we also see the world through those narratives now, I'm going to add a third ingredient to this called icons. Female genital mutilation became an icon in certain communities. It, it, be, it was even so if narratives are massive compression engines and filters and selective engines, which we need in order to manage this too big world, icons are even more compressed. They're like, they're like diamonds in that they're very hard. And... And so we use these icons to test narratives. So we use narratives to test data. We use icons to test narratives. And so when her friend, who was also a feminist, there's identity, said she believed in, you know, she wasn't going to be outraged by female genital mutilation. Well, now suddenly we're dealing at the icon level. And yes, no, icons are very binary. Yes, no. Yes, no. Icon, if it's you agree with the icon or you don't agree with the icon, it's a watershed. 
okay? And now, the reason I use icon is that it's an image you see, in a sense, through to the narrative, and yet it's also a function of the narrative. And all these things go back and forth, okay? And, and that's a very short summary into, I think, just a model of, of cognition that, that I'm thinking about as I watch all these videos. I mean, because this is all data. And then I put it into narrative, and then there are icons. And, and, and icons are, of course, deeply religious because they see through to other worlds. And they see through, in that sense, to heaven. I'm being crude, but that was the basic argument. And I remember thinking, what the hell? How can you possibly call yourself a feminist and believe in defending the rights of women and believe that women should be... See? There's the icon. What, what what happened to your narrative? Because icons you don't use so much. They're they're very static. They're very compressed. They're very hard. They're they're sort of like stars in the sky, or let's say diamonds in the sky that we use to navigate. But again, so you've got data, you've got narrative, you've got icons, and so now testing the narrative and therefore the identity of her conversation partner be safe and have equality of opportunity to men and also believe that female genital mutilation can be justified in any universe and so it was the first justified in any universe it's a universal okay this is this is i i don't like the language i'm increasingly i'm gonna have to do a words that fudge video on the word objective because it's it's i think too fraught call me postmodern. i think it's too fraught Universal is a better word, right, Strawn? You're listening. I know you are. Object. It's too fraught. First time, and in, in a, it was very uncomfortable. But in a way, I'm grateful for it because the ideas that I started to encounter, both in classes and also socially at school, those are the ideas that have now swallowed the culture and have swallowed the institutions that are meant to uphold the liberal order. Ah. Okay, and now let's talk about that for a minute, because why are you so convinced that that's true? Like, I mean, I- What's I've, true? That they that swallowed though, everything? Yes, exactly, exactly, right? Because this is a, a major question, so our culture is facing- Now, it's important that you know that we have Toronto talking to New York here. That's not an incidental aspect of this conversation. I don't know where Barry Weiss is. She's in New York or Los Angeles. Uh, she's not in- Baton Rouge, Louise, and she's not in Baton Rouge or, you know, someplace else in the middle of the United States. Facing this extreme division, or that's what it appears. And but the question is, is it as serious as it as as you might perceive it to be, or is that a consequence of the information sources that you're availing yourself of? And of course, this is exactly the same thing. Now you've got the epistemic crisis, because now we're always aware of that. We're aware of our formation. This is part of the reason the secret sacred self, which is people imagine that, well, deep down inside of me, there's an identity that I'm always aspiring for. It's, it's, it's universal and it's fixed, but it's also always malleable and mutable applies to me. I mean, I saw this coming as far as I'm concerned, you know, well, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but more particularly five years ago. And, you know, that's got me in all sorts of trouble. But it seems to me to be something real and something dangerous. And I'm trying to put my finger on exactly what it is and to warn people about it. But it's not like I don't have my doubts about, you know, whether this is just my conspiratorial idiosyncrasy making itself known in the world. And so, I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think the question is whether or not. Okay, what do we mean by conspiracy? That there's a group of people somewhere in a back dark room who are plotting this. No, it's it's emergent is what it is. The optimists are right and this thing is a moral panic and it will burn itself out. I am more on the optimistic thing, but I think we need to talk about it. Just like, you know, panic around satanic, you know, child interesting illustration watch jonathan pajot child molesters burned them that that burned out in the 1980s in this country and maybe in canada too i'm not sure yes definitely well we always do things a little less extremely <laughs> but we follow along in your way right so the question we appreciate our um we appreciate your humble faithful service it is like are those people right 
you know, will wokeness, I hate that word, but I don't know what else to call it. Will it recede on its own like a fever? I hate that word. It's emergent, but I don't know what else to call it. For that burns itself out or will it only sort of, um, let's say, lose the battle over the culture and over sense making and over the elite institutions in America and more broadly in the West if it meets another force that pushes against it? I don't see it receding on its own. And the more I look inside, you know, certainly the press, I have a front row seat to witness that and we can talk about it. Now, part of her anxiety is the assumption that these institutions, like the New York Times, that are increasingly losing educational authority. Now, don't get me wrong. I've said many times that, I mean, Oh, YouTube is going to replace television. No, it isn't. And don't forget, YouTube is built on Google. And as much as I know Brett Weinstein might love to get onto BitChute or Odyssey or um, ThinkSpot or some other platform, nothing's nothing on the horizon challenges YouTube right now. There's no question about it. Same with Twitter. Oh, we're going to start a new Twitter. Uh, Clubhouse is coming up, yada, yada, yada. So hard to know. Let's Ed, talk about it. So but, what... but education, science, uh, big tech, the HR departments of major corporations in this country, like it's touching everything. Yeah, it is. It's emergent. And you I know, I got a notification from my university department today they developed a contract for undergraduates who are going to work in labs, which seems to me to be completely unnecessary anyways, because that was something that was always handled by individual professors. But most of it's just, you know, care of data and, and the sorts of things that you might expect that might be made explicit if you were going to work in a lab. But of course, two thirds of the way in it, there's a huge statement about all the groups that you're not allowed to um, be prejudiced against in your conduct. And, and so we had this whole problem in psychology that they're only do getting data from certain groups. This policy might ensure that that distortion of the psychological data continues because you can't notice anything that might be problematic about a particular group. Yeah, smart. No, so and and fair enough. I mean, as my in my place in the Christian Reformed Church where we deal with some of this, I'm fairly buffered. And, and so forth. And so it's just another example of how these ideas, these let's call them anti-racist ideas for the time being, or anti-group prejudice ideas, are there. there's an insistence that they manifest themselves everywhere. And you might say, well, you know, who isn't anti-racist? And so why object to that? And my sense is that, well, they don't come they're not part, they're not, they don't stand on their own. They're part of an entire system of ideas. That's the thing that, that, that it's always bothered me is that there's a whole system of ideas here. And, and, and this system of ideas infiltrated the blue church. And I think it was Peugeot with Rafe Kelly. And I think he's right. In a lot of ways, the new atheists there's some responsibility for this. I want to get to the part of this video that I'm thinking about, though. That would be that would, inequality of outcome conveniently described for the purposes of justi justifying the ideology. Yeah, let me describe. What OK, so what we're going to deal with now is a lot of language, because one of the things that when you, let's say you're in a seminary education and you're learning Greek and Hebrew and you're trying to learn exegesis with Greek and Hebrew, is well where is the meaning located it isn't is it in the words or is it in the sentence or is it in the paragraph paragraph or is it in the book or is it in the library which is what the bible is and you're you're always dealing with those issues and now again when the the substrata has shifted and lots of new things are emerging bubbling up from beneath and and there's no connection with heaven and we get this mess how I like some of the, the features of this ideology, and you tell me if you agree, that inequality of outcome is necessarily a result of systemic discrimination or systemic bigotry. Okay, that, and that's part of the equity issue. Sure. 
But again, that's another one of these words that's been hijacked. I, I know. Well, that How do you hijack a word? Oh, you might say, oh, that's obvious. Did you pay attention to the words you were using? You hijack an airplane. You hijack a car. You hijack a word. Whole bunch of mental pictures, huh? Whole bunch of stories, huh? That's exactly why I brought it up, is because I've been talking to a group of people in, in, in L.A. who are liberals, and on left of me, I would say. But Again, and all, all the difficulty with that word liberal. We've been stuck on this issue of equity because I've been insisting, for example, that it does mean it's a drive towards equality of outcome defined in exactly the manner that you describe. And their insistence is no, that... Did you notice that I used it when I read on in that Oneida book? What did they mean by it? That was a bit before all of this. It's a view that only a minority of the people who are pushing the idea of equity hold. Well, and the majority of people that go along with, you know, equity. Okay, but now look at how we're talking. A majority of people. Anybody do that survey? No, that's that's it's the only way we can do it. It's all through my anecdotal experience the little groups that I circulate with. Just think, I believe in fairness. They're not thinking yes. deeply about this. Fairness. It's like when you cut the cake when you were a kid? It's like the person that says Black Lives Matter. Well, of course, Black Lives Matter. But if you look under the hood of what the organizations that are at the forefront of the Black Lives Matter movement believe, well, they believe in, you know, abolishing the nuclear family. They believe. There's an icon right there. The nuclear family, bang. Female genital mutilation, bang. Those are the icons. You're using those to, to evaluate the narratives which come up from the data, which themselves filter the data. Believe in abolishing or defunding the police. They believe that capitalism- More icons. Is evil. I mean, they believe in all kinds of things, but the majority of people that are saying or putting up a sign, Black Lives Matter, are saying racism's bad. The majority of people that are saying and if i do this video on dealing with what they talked about here I mean, we're going to have to talk about the definition of racism what do we mean by that word and and to a certain degree when you when you get to the point that you have to start redefining words you know we're in a transition point like zach signed there's the there's the horizontal transition and then there's the well in some ways you're seeing the heavens from a different place but of course heaven heaven pulls you up I believe in equity and diversity are saying, I believe in the dignity of difference and I believe in fairness and I believe in equality of opportunity. The dignity of difference. Well, that one snuck in fast. Well, what do you mean by that? Opportunity. So when the people in these theoretical people in LA, when they're saying that, is that what they mean or do they mean something else? No, they mean, they, well, I think what they mean is that the people who are pushing equity believe in equality of opportunity. And they don't see the the, the Trojan lurking. horseness. They, they're exactly right, and yeah. these are reasonable people, and they're not totally. that they're not that happy with well, political correctness. I, I should also say so. They're as reasonable I, I, a group as I can communicate. But with. I have to be honest. At this point, if you can't, if one can't see the way that this language has been hijacked, and has been used. Okay, now now she's going to start talking like a missionary. If one can't see, okay, well. What's the seeing? The seeing is, and again, we've learned this through AI, the seeing is the narrative. You see through a narrative. So if, if one doesn't have that narrative of mind, you get your icons, you get your narrative, and you get your world, you get your data. If one can't see, hmm, we're, 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 we're drawing lines here. You can communicate. But I have to be honest, at this point. I have to be honest. It's all these little religious tells we use. If you can't, if one can't see. At this point. They're not that happy with well, political correctness, I, I should also say. So they're as reasonable I, I, a group as I can communicate but with. But I have to be honest, at this point, if you can't, if one can't see the way that this language has been hijacked and has been used as a kind of Trojan horse, brilliant, I should say, Trojan horse strategy to smuggle in um, a sort of what exactly are we smuggling Jesus no it's not Jesus
Now, now also pay attention again if you looked at the looked at the previous it was only a half hour sorry for the little video I just, you know happens sometimes notice she almost never looks directly at the camera here that only comes at the, oh, I haven't checked the whole thing but because once I saw it at the end it was like oh oh she's very aware of her audience she's making her appeal this is the altar call she's she's still talking to Jordan at this point hardened identity you know zero sum identity politics view of the world to smuggle in a view of the world in which we either have collective guilt or collective innocence there's there's another element of this and and again it's emergence and we're we're starting to name it i mean that's that whole process that we've been at for the last few years is naming these elements because they've emerged up and said hey, wait a minute this is douglas murray does the same this collective guilt and collective innocence and I, again, me as a reform minister says, well, I know all about this. We've been talking about this for a long, long time. It's literally based on the circumstances of our birth. Literally based on the circumstances of our birth. I, I don't know how many of it be, you know, how many circumstances are you talking about? It smuggle in a, you know, deeply anti-capitalist position that smuggle in essentially you know, a leftist illiberalism, then I'm sorry, you have blinders on. I, I, the evidence for this is so overwhelming at this point. Speaking as a religious person. I'm really not sure how, like, if you, if you, okay, don't, want, so if, if you don't want to believe it, I think it's because the discomfort of believing it outweighs. So now you're psychologizing your your social political adversary pathologizing them oh now you're now you're uh now you're a capitalist phobe you're a capitalist phobe or you're a you're a now you're you're afraid you know that's that's part of our bag of tricks i use it too then the, let me let me say that again yeah. i think it's because the she's looking for words there's emergence here she's looking for emanation that admitting that that's true and that that's what's happening is extremely psychologically scary. What's remarkable here is that this argument has, I've even seen this use, argument used how many times in how many places. We call them homophobes and transphobes. Now, racists obviously comes from an earlier age, so we didn't get the whole, we didn't psychologize it all there. So... So, so, so what, what, what are the woke afraid of? I mean, that's, that's, that's how she's sort of putting it together here. It's very interesting. And it's extremely socially scary if you are a liberal, because all of a sudden it means that these institutions and the. Uh, so, so now almost this phobia sort of switches here. I might be wrong about this. And now it's like, now it's our, you know, team, team. IDW, now Team IDW is having their phobic moment, and now suddenly we realize, oh my goodness, they've changed all the meanings of the words. I, I, again, I totally understand that because, I, you know, in many ways, I, I, I grew up, you know, New York area, read the New York Times, all those things. So, yeah, but, oh no, the world is changing under our feet. And let's just even say like the social world and the culture that you took for granted as being a certain thing and having certain qualities is no longer what it appears to be. And that is the perfect segue to connect it back to the New York Times. Yes, okay. yes, it is. It is the perfect segue. But before we get there, let's pause for a moment because, and I totally understand what she's saying. I've told this story before. My father going to synod that's sort of the the binational body the um that the christian reform church has every year haven't had it for two years because of covid but someone once leaned over because my father of course was deep into second wave anti-racism and racial reconciliation and all of those things that's 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 what i grew up in you know someone leaning over to to my father once at synod who knew the person talking to him knew my father's father, my grandfather, and said, "Your father was such a good conservative," and that, of course, was a was was chastising my father for his his uh, 
his progressive sentiments, at least progressive for the 19, progressives in the frame of the Christian Reformed Church for the 1970s who, who thought that uh, Timothy Christian School should be able to desegregate and allow um, African-American members of the Chicago churches in for a Christian education. So my, my father and mother worked a long time on Christian education for um, people who couldn't afford it in Patterson, New Jersey. And so, but I could very much imagine many of many people leaning over to me and Paul, your father was such a reliable progressive. What happened to you? And, 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 you know, I hear in, in some of what she's saying is I used to be liked, you know, although she begins by saying she was the squish at the wall street journal. So in that group of people, she was liked. And then at one place in this video, she talks about just how hard it was for her to no longer be on the in group. Just look up C.S. Lewis's essay on the inner ring and, and how, and Peterson knows this, this is deeply troubling for her. Okay, so let's do that. That, that I agree with you, that let's do that now. So now you're at the Wall Street Journal and, and you're, you're starting to write there. Well, uh, yeah, and uh, let's just fast forward that I, I get to the New York Times and suffice it to say that, you know, I, I was never popular. Um, I had already published lots of things. I was known as um, being a Zionist. I, I was known for, for, you know, views that put me outside of the, let's say, the, the cool woke kids table. And what do you mean by you were never popular? That you just, you glo I love when Peterson's a psychologist. I love in these conversations. Hey, wait a minute. I'm a clinical psychologist. You just said something that's pretty important, and we're not going to just glaze over that little tidbit. Lost over that very rapidly. Sure. So what, there's what an I, that's one of my favorite Petersons. Experience there. There was a skepticism of me from the beginning, uh -huh. but I mean... It was the New York Times. It's the most important journalistic platform in the world. Ah, uh, it's the church. It's the status. It's the heavens. I had arrived. And so I was more than willing to um, put up with, you know, getting the cold shoulder from some of my colleagues because the... <laughs> it, you, you can just can't overstate how powerful that distribution system is. Much Yeah, more so than the Wall Street Journal. And it mm -hmm. holds a certain position, I would say, just not beyond America, you know, in position, status, height. Remember, we started with Zach Stein. We're between worlds. Well, she's wound up between worlds in 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 the mm -hmm. West. Um, and and so I, I was loath to give that up. And I would be willing and was willing to put up with a lot in order to cling to that position. Why? Hey, Jordan, we're not we're not doing therapy on here, but, you know, lots of meat in that meat, lots of meat on that bone for a clinical psychologist. How do you think people saw you the, like because they 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 assumed they made a, a variety of assumptions about sure. you and that was what was alienating. What is it that you represented or were in their eyes? Do you heresy, think? heresy? The whole thing is a religious conversation. It's heresy. Someone who. But but in this context, those wokesters, they're the religious ones, not us. We're in the bright cloud of secularism. We're not religious at all. Really? Lived like them, went to the same restaurants as them, dated like them. Um, you know, by all... She's a lesbian. You're supposed to be on our side. Metrics should have agreed with them on every tenant of this new orthodoxy. But I did Right, so you're worse because of that. See, I just talked to... Uh, Traitor. Rima Azar, um, professor at Mount Ellison, who's, who's an Arab um, immigrant to Canada, Lebanese, and she just got hung out to dry by the pathetic cowards at her university for, for not to mince words there jordan what was her sin she doesn't exactly know but remember these are secularist people so now we can use this 
these terms sort of pejoratively. But she's looking around for emanation. She really is. No, but apparently it was something like incitement to sexual violence and also insistence that Canada isn't a systemically racist country. And, and she wrote some of this in her blog, which she thought was mostly for distribution to her friends. And anyways, uh, she, but she's a heretic like you are because she's female and she's an immigrant to Canada. And so it's incumbent upon her to adopt the victimized identity that people like her should know is good for them. And because she didn't, although in a quite a minor way, she really literally doesn't know what her crime was. She now, what's interesting is that, again, we have these full inversions where after the 60s to be many people branded heretic as a an emblem of pride i was kicked out of the church and so of course the church was this is where you get into peugeot's um peugeot's parasitic storytelling i was i was kicked out i mean steve jobs would proudly call himself a heretic because all this christendom i'm pushing against it yada 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 but now this is a church they didn't want to get kicked out of. This is a church they really believed in. In a lot of ways, they're not a lot that different from the, the deconstructed wokesters in terms of the dynamic that comes. She doesn't really know who her accusers were. They suspended her without pay. She's a tenured professor. It's a worse case than the case in New York with Paul Rossi. It's much worse. It's quite stunning. I mean, if you met her, you'd think, why is it stunning? See, see, again, for me, I inhabit a church world where you do heresy, you commit certain sins. Uh, yeah, suspended without pay. It ain't suspended. You're out. And now, well, wait a minute. That's not supposed to happen in our world. Our world is you didn't think you inhabited a religious structure. You didn't think that. Well, but the religious structure is changing. Oh, you're looking for a theological dispute. Go back and watch, Tom, listen to Tom, Hall, Tom Holland and Dominic Sandbrook's culture war. Tom Holland's definition of a culture war is a war which is fundamentally theological in Christendom. That's what they're fighting. Now, what you have to do is begin to ask yourself, now, wait a minute, what religion were you? Because that is actually the more helpful question. Now, again, I'm sort of running out of time right now, and so this will be it for video making today. I'll post the first one I, I will have posted on Tuesday, and I'll likely post this one Wednesday morning. It'll be a little longer than the 30-minute one, so sorry about that, I know. Julian, that you and your dumpster welders up there in Canada get really annoyed when I have a shorty. But the real question to ask underneath all of this is, now, wait a minute, what was your religion before? Well, we're going to call it classical liberalism. Okay. Why did it fail? Why did it fail? Why was it so susceptible by being eaten from the inside? That's really how most religions die. They're eaten from the inside. And that's why, in another way, Jordan Peterson's Darwinian, Darwinian approach to truth is so powerful because the religions that last, well, there might be something to them. And we're going to have to see what happens to Christianity because it's, you know, I know, boy, this stuff gets so complicated. Because that religion of the New York Times before its fall in the eyes of Barry Weiss and Jordan Peterson, I've got some of that religion in me. Did I know it was in me? How, to what degree was it sort of wheat and tares, Jesus' parable, just sort of all interlocked in me? And so now with this, with this struggle, well, now in a sense I get to pull it apart and take a look at it and say, hmm, maybe I need to critique that. Well, Against what can I critique it? Well, heaven. Heaven. And, and what's happening in our culture, actually, is that the fundamentalist and the rebel wisdom group 
are, are almost on the same page. There's a little bit more of that video I want to play for you. Remember, we were talking about educational authority. I'm going to ask Danny Mulhern if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your first question. Thanks, David. Hi, Zach. Thanks very much for this. Um, yeah, my question is, if you had a nine-year-old preparing... Um, All of the fancy words here comes down to action, right? For secondary education at this time, what kind of schooling would you be considering? Uh, <laughs> it would depend on so many factors. It would depend on where you live. It would depend on the nature of the nine-year-old. Um, Remember my videos about rules and guidelines? Very guideline guy. Systemic thinker, broad view, you know, you're going to have this Hemin and Han. I do it too. I get it. It's, it's a function of the culture. How much money you have, uh, a whole bunch of things. So it's very hard to give general advice. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, in Vermont, if I have a nine-year-old, <laughs> and I don't, if I was living in Vermont, um, I would likely be uh, involved with unschooling and homeschooling networks. Oh, I thought it was those radicals like, you know, Esther O'Reilly, that 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 young woman who was homeschooled by those religious conservatives and those fundamentalists. So. There it is. There it is. Homeschool your kid. Wow. 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 Yeah, yeah. Institutions, they're breaking down. It's going to be a bumpy ride, folks. <laughs>